the situation right now is very volatile. Fortune Magazine, Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, and all of these uh, business magazines are saying this is unreal. And what's unreal is that oil prices went negative, below zero for the first time in history. This has never happened before. And as a result of that, we already know what's going to happen. There will be jobs that will be lost. There will be old practices, old norms, things that used to be normal are going to evaporate. They're going to be volatile. Old established rules and regulations are going to be gone. And this title of this week's message for you is Volatile Up Ahead. And I'm not saying that, for those of you who know me, I'm not a doomsday preacher. I'm a reality preacher, and I believe that in the midst of that reality, God is there. What do you do when you're dealing with volatility up ahead, things that can evaporate right before your eyes? The question is, what do you already know in order to move ahead? Well, we do know that 2020, four months of the year are gone. In other words, one-third of the year is gone. And we do know that time will not wait for us. And so what do you do when you're faced with the reality that it's very possible, they say, vaccines will not be invented until about 15 months from now. It's very possible that 15 months from now, the old things that we were used to are not coming back. So what do you do? Well, the scripture tells us in Isaiah, forget the former things. There are some things that you need to forget. Maybe not completely abandon, but start forgetting them and start not dwelling on the past. What that means is don't live there. Dwell means live. Don't live there anymore. That thing is going to be gone. And it says, see, I'm doing a new thing. But you can't see the new thing God is doing if you're looking where you shouldn't be looking. And so God wants us to turn and start looking into the future. And he says, see, and you're going to miss it. You're not going to see it. If you don't look there, I am doing a new thing. A new thing means change. You need to see that certain things are not going to be the same. They're going to change. And then he says this, now it springs up. In other words, this thing is going to just spring up. It's just going to happen. It's going to move forward. And if you're looking at the old former things, or the things that are dying, you might miss the thing that's springing up. Then he asks you a question. Do you perceive it? Do you know that these things are changing? Are you looking further into the future to know that I am making a way? He's making new ways. But the ways he's making is in the wilderness. In other words, the things that you're not familiar with. We probably need to start asking ourselves, what new skills do I need to learn? What new practices do I need to have? My wife gave me a haircut, <laughs> a new practice that she, she, she didn't know how to do that. And, and she had to learn. And I had to learn to accept the fact that my barber now is in my house. And then it says, streams in the wasteland. Places that you otherwise don't want to go to are probably going to be places you have to go to. Question for you today. What areas of your life are you still holding on to the past? And in what areas of your life do you discern that God is moving you forward? Ask yourself this question. What are the areas of your life that you're still holding on and your God's telling you, hey, I'm trying to let you understand there's new things out there. Now, it's possible that you understand that. But the question is, okay, pastor, I get it. New things are happening. Forget the four. But how? how do I, what do I do right here and now when everything around me is volatile, if not dying, before my eyes? There's a story in the Bible that is worth looking at to understand how. The story is Jesus and Lazarus. His friend Lazarus has died, and, and we find Jesus. What did Jesus do when the things died around him? What do you do when the things around you become volatile and are dying and changing and shifting? The story begins in John chapter 11, but I'm going to jump down to John 11 verse 11. Jesus is telling his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. I'm going there to wake him up. It's funny how his disciples thought, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. You know, if he rests, you're going to get better. 
But Jesus had been speaking to them about his death, but his disciples thought he meant he was just having a natural sleep. So then Jesus clarified himself. He said plainly to them, no, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there to heal him so that you may believe. Sometimes when things die, God's setting us up to learn new things so that we may further increase in our believing him. Down in verse 20, when Martha, the sister of Lazarus, heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But her sister, Mary, stayed at home. Now notice, these are two people who have the same brother, who have the same experience, but have two different responses. Mary's response was to stay home. Martha's response was to go out and meet Jesus. Now, as the story unfolds, we begin to learn what Jesus does when have have different people respond in different ways. Verse 21 says, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, some people think that she was accusing him. Actually, she was not. And the reason why we know that is because of verse 22. She said, if you were actually here, you wouldn't have died. But even now, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. In other words, she was in faith. And what do you do with people who are in faith? Now, verse 23 says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. What did Jesus do with people when things around him died? Well, the first thing he did was he encouraged. He encourages. And that's what we should be doing. We should be encouraged by Jesus so that we can encourage others in return. The word encourage comes from two words. The word en, encourage. En means to put in. To encourage, therefore, is to put courage in us and for us to put courage in others. The 1828 Dictionary of the English Language defines courage as a noun or the quality of mind which enables men and women to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness or without fear or depression of spirits. That's courage. And that's what you need right now. And that's what Jesus was doing to Martha. He was encouraging her so that she can be an encourager to others. The quality of mind which enables men and women to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness, without fear, depression, or spirits, or valor, boldness, and resolution. Some people think that courage is just the idea of being daredevils or the adrenaline rush. I like one of my favorite authors, Dr. Henry Cloud, who wrote the book Boundaries, the best-selling book Boundaries, and the book, one of my favorite books, Necessary Endings, wrote a book in 2006 called Integrity. The subtitle of the book was The Courage to Meet the Demands of Reality. You know, you could be a daredevil, you could have adrenaline rushes, and you could do funny stuff, but you know what real courage is? To face the demands of the current reality. Not to back away, not to distract yourself, but to have the spirit of courage to face that current reality. Watch what happens. Verse 24 says, Martha says, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. (laughs) Watch how Jesus encourages her again. Jesus said to her, I am. I'm here, okay? I'm, not, I'm here, and I'm not just here for the resurrection or the future. I'm here for the here and now, your life. Presence. Presence is so important if you're going to be encouraged by God, to know his presence, and if you're going to encourage others, you need to be there present for them. Presence is very powerful. No, watch what happens. Verse 27, she says, yes, Lord, okay, I'm encouraged. I believe no longer that you can ask God and he will answer you. I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Encouragement is powerful. Presence is the first place. When we acknowledge the presence of God in our lives and we're present in other people's lives, we encourage them. The second way you encourage or be encouraged is through Scripture. The more you spend time meditating on the Bible day and night, the more encouraged you get. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For everything that was written in the past was written 
to teach us. Why? So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, the more you read the things that scripture writes and teaches us, the endurance of that truth will encourage you, will provide for you hope, strength, and courage to meet the future. That's the second way to be encouraged. Presence of God, Word of God. But there's a third thing I want to share with you where I find courage. I'm not a very courageous person, but I find it when I look into the future. As I showed you this picture previously, it's not just change I'm looking at. I'm looking at the values of the future. When I start looking at why I'm doing what I'm doing, I see my grandchildren, and it gives me courage to stay on in the present difficulty. I see my children and their wives, and it gives me the courage to keep doing what I'm doing. I see the world needs Jesus and discipleship, and that's why I do what I do. I see my wife. I see different things, and that's why I stay the course. When I look at that, courage comes inside of me. The verse that captures that thought is Jesus. For the joy set before him, the seeing the value of us becoming children of God, he endured and had courage to face the cross. Question for you, what things in life are so valuable to you that you're willing to be courageous for them? Take a snapshot of that. Meditate on that. Ask yourself that question. What are you willing to fight for because it's so valuable that you want to, that gets you out of that couch, that gets you out of just being distracted by all sorts of things. Our story continues in John 11, verse 28, where it says, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister. That's interesting, isn't it? She went back and called her sister. So now it's her turn to encourage others. He's now, and said, the teacher is here. And he's asking for you. She's, she's actually telling her, hey, wait, I'm now encouraged, so I want to encourage you. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and he saw him, he fell, she fell at her feet. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Notice that she said exactly the same thing that Mary said. They're, they're practically the same people with the same brother who died, the same situation, but they're two different people. In fact, while Mary was encouraged and looking for more encouragement, Mary was disturbed and Jesus saw her weeping. And even the friends that were around her were weeping. And the Bible says he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Jesus did not just encourage. He empathized. And we need to be careful in this time and season where things around us are dying and falling apart, that we're not just encouraging people. We need to understand some people are grieving. And that is real. And, it's, and let me tell you something about grieving. Grieving is natural. In fact, if you don't grieve because you lost something of value, something's wrong with you. If you lose something that is extremely valuable, when my father passed away, I had to grieve. When I went previous times when I lost jobs or businesses or, or key relationships, I had to grieve because that's reality. And by the way, Grieving is not just death and jobs. Your kids are grieving. They lost their school time. They lost their playtime. They lost their friends. And you at home can either make the time together with your children a horrible time or realize that you're all grieving and come to God and help you grieve with him. It's natural. People lose things of value. The good news is our God knows how to grieve with us. And when we allow that and realize that that's natural, this is something that will heal us. Now notice in verse 34 and 35, where have you laid him? It's powerful, isn't it? Jesus is acknowledging, I know, I, I know you're all hurt and I know you're all, and where have you laid him? Come see, Lord. They were saying, Lord, we, we, he, they, he was actually walking with them because he knew that grieving was important and then he wept, the Bible says. Because grieving is not just natural. Grieving is actually necessary, and Jesus knows that. And Jesus knows that it's part of the healing process. We grieve because we need it. 
we grieve because God designed us to be that kind of people who just don't jump up and do business as if it, nothing happened. Because the truth is, it's natural, necessary. And thirdly, it's not just natural, necessary. Grieving is different for everybody. Why? Because we have different levels of valuing certain things, and we have different makeups, we have different tolerance levels, and we saw that even between Martha and Mary. It doesn't mean that Martha didn't grieve. She just didn't grieve as long as Mary did. And when we understand that, then we know how to grieve for ourselves, and we appreciate and understand the people around us and the fact that they're in grief as well. So what do you do when you, when Jesus, when Jesus, what did Jesus do when things were dying around him? He encouraged, he grieved. And here's the second, the third question for you today. Do you know, did you know that grieving is, a na- is natural and necessary? And what possible situations do you need to grieve for? It's good to take stock of that. And if, and if you're not the type who, who wallows in grief or, or is longer to grieve, that's fine. Then you help others who are grieving. And as Jesus did, he didn't say a word of encouragement. He said very few words. He said, where did you lay him? And the rest was he wept with him. That's grieving. Verse 38 says, Jesus once more, deeply moved. Notice, he's deeply moved. But watch what he does, right? He encourages, he grieves, and then he moves on. He came to the tomb. And when he got to the tomb, he saw a stone was laid across the entrance. Here's what he did. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? In other words, he's saying, hey, guys, listen. As much as there's things dying around us, and as much as people need encouragement, and as much as we need grief, we need to believe in the glory of God, that God is a God of victory, that God's going to do something here. Now, notice what he says. Take away the stone. Now, Jesus is God. We saw an angel cast a stone out of a tomb, and he's the king of all of these angels. He could have been an avenger and pick up the stone and threw it away, but he didn't because there's a part when God moves, that he always wants us, you and I, humans, to take part in the supernatural things that he's about to do in our lives. And so he says to the people, take away the stone. The people were complaining, but Lord, Martha was complaining. But by that time, God, this is impossible. My job's gone. My situation's gone. My children, are, it's not going to happen anymore. But he says, no, just take it away. doesn't matter how ugly, how smelly, how bad it is. And you know the rest of the story. He calls out, Lazarus, come forth. He lives, they take away the bandages, and he's well. What does Jesus do? He encourages, he empathized, and finally, he moved forward. Sometimes we keep waiting for someone to encourage us. Sometimes we keep waiting for someone to empathize with us. And sometimes God's just saying, it's time to move. Time to go forward. The way to move forward, as I pondered this and thought about this, is really very simple. It's about when things die. How do you see death? Do you see death as the end of the story? Or do you see death as a rebirth? Because those are two different ways of seeing life. Do you see death? When my father passed away, there was grieving. I loved my father. But at the same time, I knew it was a rebirth. When I saw that, then I could move forward. When I see death as an end of my life right now, I get depressed. When I see that Jesus is the resurrection life, that there is rebirth in death. By the way, this is very important. The way you approach this situation, these new shifts and changes, these former things and the new things that God has, Depends on this. If you see these changes happening and the past dying as the end of the story, you're going to approach life very differently. If you see it as a rebirth, you're going to approach it with victory and you will have success. Final question for this service. Do you view death as an end or a rebirth? Which one is it? Better question is, Why do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart because I believe that's what Scripture teaches. God, thank you that there is nothing that overwhelms you. And as such, 
there's nothing that should overwhelm us. So we look to you, God, and trust you, Jesus, that you are our Savior, our Lord, our Master, and that in you, God, even as we proclaim the reality of who you are, not just our salvation, God, but your divine hand over our lives, our lives are blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.